Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Washington, uh, for those of you that are from out of town, and welcome to those that are watching us on the live stream from, uh, I guess, all over the country and all over the world. I want to start this morning by uh, uh, thanking our, our sponsor, generous sponsor from Green Cities Fund. Uh, I want to thank the members of our, our newly formed U.S.-Cuba Cooperative Working Group, and obviously want to thank the National Press Club for, uh, for hosting us here. This morning, uh, you know, we're talking about a historic event at a historic time in Cuban and U.S. relations. Actually, uh, I understand just as we're underway here, negotiations are getting started again uh, between the two governments and between the, the governments to, to work on all of the things that uh, they're going to talk about to try to bring the economic relationship and the government relationships back together. Um, we're here to launch, at the same time that negotiation is going on, this U.S.-Cuba Cooperative Working Group uh, for uh, cooperatives to really play a strong part in the next steps in the relationship between Cuba and the United States. And uh, a number of the working group members uh, traveled there in uh, 2014 in July, um, and that came really as a result of some changes that happened uh, in Cuba in 2013 in July, uh, really where the Cuban government began to, to uh, alter and change a lot of the businesses that were all government owned and transform them into cooperatives. Now, all of that's happening in, in a very fast pace and uh, our panelists are gonna talk more about that but uh, I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of background and, and bring you forward and uh, then we're gonna stop and, and uh, take questions from the press. So. Um, you know, just to talk on U.S. cooperatives by the numbers, just to give you some sense, because when we're talking about cooperatives, we've got to set the stage. Uh, 40,000 of them operate in the U.S., over three trillion in assets, two million jobs here in the U.S. economy, and 652 billion dollars in sales. You know, one of the questions I get is, you know, what is a cooperative? It's a business owned for and by the consumers for their mutual benefit. And there's lots of examples, and uh, some of the examples, one is at the table. Martin is, is representing electric co-ops, credit unions, uh, so you, you probably know both of those, but a lot of brands are cooperative. So Ace Hardware, REI, Ocean Spray, Organic Valley, uh, those are all uh, producer farmer co-ops. So, you know, these, this cooperative business and this cooperative business model has been very important to building the American economic model and landscape. And as Cuba has been evolving over the last couple of decades, agricultural cooperatives were part of the initial wave where uh, people coming together uh, could really take on some of the land and, uh, and start to farm that land cooperatively. That's really a, a, a strong parallel to the U.S. perspective. Um, so in 2013, having the government make these changes and having other types of businesses uh, devolve to worker ownership through a cooperative uh, uh, business model has been an important part of the next steps. So this unique moment, although we're here today at the same time as the government to government action is happening, I would make the case to you uh, that this activity has been something that cooperatives have been involved in over the last 30 years or more. And really since 2013, there's been lots of effort and initiative between uh, cooperatives, the Cuban government, and the folks that are now owning those, the, the workers uh, in Cuba. Um, I was fortunate to be able to go on the trip in July of last year, so we're going to give you a little bit of some of the perspectives as we go forward as well. Uh, to tell you where uh, U.S. cooperatives are, to give you this sense, agriculture and purchasing are in the green. You know, you look there at the middle of the country, uh, this is where a lot of agriculture uh, is, has been done in the last decades, hundreds of years here. Uh, through farmer cooperatives. Uh, the uh, gold is utility. Uh, rural America wouldn't be what it is without electric co-ops. Almost 50 million people get their energy, uh, their electricity from electric co-ops, and I know Martin will touch on that. Uh, financial, uh, red are the credit unions, almost 6,000 of them, uh, 100 million members. These are huge movements uh, across this country. And housing, worker, and education, are the blue, and you see them typically uh, uh, bunched up in, in the coast along the uh, northeast border and then in California and up in Seattle. So that's where co-ops are in the U.S. 
giving you some, some sense of the economic numbers. 235 billion uh, is what we represent in the nation's economy. You see some of the brands I mentioned there, Navy, Federal, Lando Lakes, Ocean Spray, Nationwide Insurance, Sunkist, Ace, REI, and some of the numbers in the, uh, in the sectors. All of this is underpinned by principle. As the National Cooperative Business Association, we are 100 years old coming into this year. Uh, we have been uh, working with all of the sectors uh, on the cooperative development, on the activities that they pursue, making sure that, that we have the right legislative and regulatory framework for cooperatives. But I would tell you that these principles, voluntary and open membership, democratic member control, member economic participation, autonomy and independence, uh, education, training, and information, Number six, which is very important to us, cooperation among cooperatives uh, and concern for community are all really the framework that cooperatives operate in. And this is good for consumers. This is good for American consumers. And we believe it's also going to be good um, as the Cuban economy evolves that these principles uh, be part of the DNA of much of Cuba's economy, that the transition uh, that we all hope is coming uh, to a more democratic and open uh, country, we feel will be bolstered uh, by these seven cooperative principles. So um, I'll keep going. Here's Cuba itself. In, in talking a little bit about the working group, what I want to tell you is that this working group has been put together uh, across the sectors. Its goals and aims are to begin to create the economic ties uh, between the two countries. We're also working towards making sure that as cooperatives grow in Cuba, that we learn from what they're doing because they're forming a huge basis of their economy. And there is a lot for U.S. cooperatives to learn from this process. But we're also wanting to make sure that we get the opportunity and, and we work with them uh, to really work on issues like governance. That for every cooperative, no matter where it's located, Governance is a key and fundamental part of the operation of the organization. And this governance is really going to be part of making sure that as uh, Cuba does open up, uh, that, that its, its residents, its, its local folks, have the opportunity to, to retain control of parts of the economy that are vital to them. And cooperatives are the vehicle that allow for that. So as the, the Cuban government is evolving lots of parts of the local businesses in Cuba, um, that local folks understand what that right and that responsibility is, is an important part of our next steps. So this is an example of one of the Cuban cooperatives that uh, the four of us visited in the summer. And you might say, well, Mike, you, you talked about credit unions or electric co-ops or uh, Ace Hardware, but wow, what is this? This is a cooperative garage. And these are the member owners. These folks are all the guys that are changing your oil, putting new tires on your car, and there was about 17 of them. They are the owners of the cooperative. What the Cuban government has done is uh, provided a, a leasing of the space the business existed, obviously, before the transition in 2013 with the new legislation. And these folks are operating the garage, really as they did before. Um, the, the consumer uh, service is uh, as it was before, but with some great exceptions. And the exceptions are, what we saw when we talked to these folks was they're working longer hours. They're working longer hours because they're trying to grow this business. And the intensity and the passion behind growing this business has been about earning more for their families. And that's what co-ops do, is provide earnings for working families. It's a global experience. So this was a great example to see. Uh, we got to see cars come and go. We got to see some fabulous cars come and go, I would say that. The one thing that, that I would say personally about getting a chance to go to Cuba was some fabulous 1950s cars. Um, and how they work on those and keep them on the road, these guys were, uh, were a big part of. So this is one of the examples of uh, what's going on there. And uh, uh, what I can say, at least from my own experience, is 
These guys were passionate about making sure um, that this business was perceived as uh, run by them, owned by them, and that uh, you were going to get good quality service. And that's all part of the cooperative experience. So I'm going to introduce our first panel. Uh, Eric Leeson uh, is president of Soul Squared Economics. Uh, Martin Lowry is the executive vice president of the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association. And Amy Kokenauer is the chief operating officer for international development for NCB Inclusive. We work together. Um, so I'm going to stop here and uh, uh, see if we've got questions from our press panel. And I'm going to take the questions and, and maybe direct them. And these guys are going to help me with, uh, with some answers to them. So <clears throat> we have questions. We need a microphone too, sorry. Ellen Ferguson, uh, CQ Roll Call. The way the cooperatives are structured, is it a light government involvement? Because I talked to a senator who had gone down there and looked at the co-ops and she seemed to think that the government was very heavily involved um, and therefore not a real good matchup for the business structure in the United States. And she's pro opening up Cuba. Well, I'm going to start by saying the reality is the starting point is that all of these businesses were government owned. So there's an evolution taking place and that evolution is underway. Um, you know, I, I do think that what we saw in the example I showed you there of the garage, I think they want less uh, government interference, um, but it's, it's a, you know, it's a destination. It's a, it's a journey to get there. Um, Eric, I was going to draw you in and see if you had some other thoughts on this as well. Well, I, I think it's important to look back at Cuba and understand that cooperatives have been active since the time of the revolution. There are more than 5,000 cooperatives functioning in Cuba, the majority of which are agricultural. Uh, it's only been recently, as Mike pointed out, that non-agricultural cooperatives have started forming. Now, if you look at the laws that set up these um, cooperatives, it's clear they are independent business entities in which the members do make the decisions about the leadership and about the businesses they will maintain. And that's important to understand. And of course, it's much more developed in the agricultural sector, which has been around longer. Now, in the case of the newly formed non-agricultural cooperatives, what we're seeing, as Mike said, is in many cases an evolution from a former state enterprise to a fully operating cooperative, democratically elected officers and managed. However, within that situation, there are many relations with the government, not in terms of managing the cooperatives, but because of the economic situation in Cuba, in which you have limited quantities of things, in which you have basically um, many areas of state control of the economy, of course, there are going to be relationships between the cooperatives and the government. So for example, as Mike pointed out, in the case of these newly formed cooperatives, while they're independent businesses, they may be leasing equipment from the state or the facilities because they don't have the money to set those up. Interestingly, I've learned in talking with people, and I've, I've made about 15 trips to Cuba in the past five years, um, that we see a situation in which the terms the governments are putting forward in, le in leasing these entities, the necessary equipment, are actually quite favorable. There is general, genuinely an interest on the part of both the cooperatives and the government of seeing them succeed as independent entities because the government really can't and doesn't want to continue uh, maintaining a state employee controlled economy. If before the Cuban economy was, let's say, 95% state run with state employees, the plan of the government is to lower that to 50% in which the cooperatives as independent business units will really play a key role. So, sorry to go a little long-winded, but I hope no. that answers your question. I think it's good. Next question. Hi, Victoria Guia with Politico. Um, legally, are cooperatives allowed in, in all sectors? And, um, you know, given that the new U.S. regulations require that there be a, a private end user for the stuff that U.S. exporters ship to Cuba, um, you know, is, are the, co are the cooperatives likely to be, you know, a very large percentage of that? And is that is sort of facilitating a relationship between U.S. businesses 
and uh, Cuban cooperatives part of the work that you all are planning to do? The uh, one part I'll, I'll start with is that, you know, as we're looking at the regulations, and we're, we're going to have a whole panel on this in the second part, um, is that we want to be sure that cooperatives are a scene on par with other types of uh, for-profit businesses um, and that the business model is not in any way uh, put at a lesser uh, category than, than other business models. So that's one part of it. Um, I think that you know, as you get to the, the rest of your question, I'm going to maybe defer to Eric and Eric have you kind of walk us through you know, how has the, the framework changed there? Okay. <clears throat> well, again, I, and I can't emphasize this enough. The history, long history in Cuba with cooperatives is in agricultural sector. And if you look at the food that's produced and consumed in Cuba today, the great bulk of it is produced by cooperatives. Okay? The non-agricultural sector is still limited in terms of which businesses can be formed into cooperatives. And if you'd like, we can go into some detail about that. But it's not any business can become a cooperative. But many, many can. Um, so I think it's important to understand that Cuba is in a transition period. Essentially, back in 2011, the Cuban government announced, in essence, that, you know what, our economic model isn't working, and it needs to be what they call updated. It need, we would call new reforms need to be put in place. And ever since then, it's been a transition of movement, of change, in which there's clearly a emphasis on the development of a cooperative sector. One, because Cuba desperately needs to produce more food. It imports far too much food at this point, and cooperatives can become a very strategic player in changing that dynamic. And also, as I mentioned before, the change in the employment model of getting you know, small businesses, the state has said, should not have been part of the state, not be much state run. They should be much more independent. So these are things that are happening. So if you look at Cuba today, you've only had non-agricultural cooperatives since July of 2013, not even two years yet. So it's really kind of an experiment. And the government is very clear about saying what we're doing now is we're setting up, going to be setting up thousands of cooperatives under experimental law to see how they function and what can be done to improve it. So the projection at this point is that the general cooperative law that will be a definitive law will be enacted in 2016. And right now, they're analyzing what's going on in Cuba with regard to the cooperatives. And they're also going abroad. Trust me, they're sending delegations to many different countries to see how the cooperative movements in those countries function successfully. But to get to your question about economic relations between the two countries, I would say at this point that um, the greatest possibility will be with agricultural cooperatives in Cuba. One, because that's really what the Cuban government is emphasizing, because of the need to increase food production. And I think the potential is enormous both ways, but especially from US cooperatives to Cuban cooperatives. I think the needs for inputs, for equipment, for know-how are large. And I think the cooperative sector here in the US is very well positioned to do that. I think there can also be some exchange of sale of products from Cuban agricultural um, cooperatives to the U.S., particularly the kind of things that we don't produce very easily in our climate, that are the more tropically oriented, the, the um, sugar, the ca uh, coffee, etc. But that's going to be small in the beginning. And quite frankly, with regard to the non-agricultural cooperatives in the different sectors, they're really geared towards local needs. It's about building. Uh, it's about creating consumer market, uh, local food markets. It's about all sorts, it's about transportation, taxis and buses, all sorts of local infrastructure. So I think there's a possibility that we can have some exchange, but I don't think there'll be a lot of formal import or export around that for the time being. Today, actually, in the negotiations, financial services is on the table, and I think that's going to be, you know, part of the, the, the complication is unwinding some of uh, what OFAC presents, some of uh, you know how uh, Cuban Americans, as they come back and forth, uh, do finances, and uh, I'm sure Patrick's going to talk a little bit about credit unions a little further when we get uh, to the second panel. Questions? 
Mary Berger with Washington Trade Daily. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about what you see your group's role being in Cuba. Um, are you hoping to form sort of joint partnerships between U.S. and Cuban um, cooperatives? And um, what might you be doing on the Hill in terms of as, as it becomes a little bit clearer how the regulations are going to play out and, you know, in terms of what you might need beyond that? I, I think this working group is a great opportunity for, for uh, us to focus the U.S. cooperative uh, sectors, the movements on, on what's going on in Cuba. Um, our organization is both a trade association and an NGO. Um, so they also, the cooperative sectors also look to us uh, to lead some of that uh, effort. Um, we have been focusing time and attention. We actually uh, produced letters uh, today uh, for uh, the administration on this group and where we see it going. Um, I'm going to ask Amy to, uh, to jump in here and talk a little bit more in depth about the working group and uh, some of its uh, mission and context. So one of the main objectives of the working group was really to get uh, an understanding of what's going on with the cooperative sector in Cuba. But it's also very much in the context of our work as an organization that's been working internationally for 60 years, working with cooperative sectors around the world. Um, primarily in, agri in sustainable agriculture, but also natural resources management, working with women and youth, community-based development. So in that context, um, we have a lot of interest in connecting directly with, with not just the, work, the cooperatives themselves, but also looking at some of the entities in Cuba that are supporting cooperatives. We met, for example, with ANAP, which is a, a, an agricultural service organization that supports the cooperative sector. Um, there, are others, there are others like that, but um, we're very interested in um, engaging in exchanges, having Cubans come to the U.S. and also having um, cooperative groups from all sectors in the U.S. Uh, going to Cuba to interact with their counterparts and just really opening up a dialogue and, an, and a platform for sharing uh, information but also technical exchanges as well. How do you improve your membership? What, how do you, um, on the governance issues that Mike raised um, in terms of the members and boards and uh, structuring those. Also, the cooperative principles and framing things um, according to the internationally accepted principles around the world that cooperatives adhere to. So there's a whole range of different kinds of exchanges and learning opportunities that we'd like to engage with. Um, the one other point I'll make is there is, right in Cuba right now, um, there are really no sec uh, secondary level cooperatives at the sectoral level. There is this there are some service organizations that are working with cooperatives, but there are no, for example, um, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association is the sectoral association for electric co-ops in the U.S., or the National Cooperative Grocers Association, or the um, Credit Union National Association. None of those kind of sectoral organizations exist right now in Cuba. So we're very interested in talking to our counterparts about that nor is there a national association like the National Cooperative Business Association. So those are longer term objectives, but we're definitely interested in starting with the worker co-ops as they are now. Mark, did you wanna? Did you wanna uh, yeah, so one thing to add, what Amy just described is a, is a pretty strong network uh, globally of, of federated organizations that support cooperatives. I'm the US representative to the International Cooperative Alliance, which is the global apex body for cooperatives. And um, we have been working with them as well to make sure that the fledgling cooperatives in Cuba are connected into the International Cooperative Alliance Americas region, which is Latin America, US, and Canada. And we see a, a large opportunity here for training and, and technical assistance. The governance piece of this, which would be true for any institution globally, is really key. Uh, the economist Jeffrey Sachs has talked about the failure of governance in all, inst all institutional levels globally. So one of the things that we concentrate on very strongly is, is the, the willingness of the, the members of the new cooperative to take governance seriously in terms of the fiduciary responsibility for the assets, the kind of decisions that get made in the boardroom, the guidance that's needed from the point of view of uh, ensuring the sustainability of the new entity. And that's an area that we have great strength cross-sectorally here in the United States that we would love to 
be able to provide. Canadian cooperatives are already involved in this through the Canadian Cooperative Association, uh, but we see a significant opportunity for U.S. Uh, capabilities and skills to come to bear. I'm just going to wrap that section up by, by just also adding back in that I, I think the work that we want to see done, and, and these guys have all said it in one way or another, is, is making sure that these co-ops tie back to the international principles. That tying back to the principles is our way of being able to understand is go good governance being practiced? Are the, demo the democratic principles uh, that, that underpin cooperatives here in the U.S. and across the globe, um, you know, being being utilized? Um, that these principles are one way that we can can work together, and they're also a linkage. So they're they're a good help to this. Next question. Alan Ferguson, uh, CQ Roll Call. I just wanted to follow up on the latter part of her question. Um, what role, if any, do you need Congress to play in order to facilitate what, what it is that you want to do? And if you need Congress to act, what, in what way, through what process, um, and who would you expect to be the leaders on that? Well, uh, you know, I think the, I, I think with the, uh, the, the linkage to what we're asking, what we would be involved with, is we have been more involved with the, the direct activity, what's happening right now. Um, we've stayed out of the political to a certain extent, and we've, we've, we are certainly watching, and in the second panel, we're gonna dive deeper into, there's you know, a number of bills that are on the table. Uh, we've not taken positions on those. The regulatory process, we have focused more of our time and energy one, making sure that cooperatives are going to be part of that, that framework and, and moving that forward. Um, but I think we have decided, you know, to stay one level, one step out of that uh, at this point uh, and, and, and let government take care of what it's going to do uh, and make sure that if businesses are going to be open, that cooperatives are there more than anything else. Other questions? I'm going to uh, just look to this panel for perhaps some short comments. We're going to switch the panels out uh, and, and keep going. But uh, Martin, I'm going to start with you. Um, some thoughts that you have. That all of us have actually been to Cuba in this last, uh, in last summer, and maybe uh, also framing some of your, uh, what you saw while you were there, how you, uh, how you interpreted things on the ground. Uh, what Amy alluded to in terms of productivity and quality uh, is, is absolutely palpable when you talk to the, the new owners of the worker cooperatives, um, the auto mechanics operation. Uh, we were in a textile factory uh, where they, they um, make uh, linen uh, tablecloths, napkins, uh, um, blouses, uniforms, and so on. Um, they were just very, very proud of the fact that they now owned the factory. As, as Eric said, it's leased from the government but at the same time, their sense of employee ownership was, was there. Uh, the other comment I'd make goes back to the discussion about agricultural cooperatives and other types of cooperatives the, and, the, and the role of government. Uh, the history of the U.S. cooperatives definitely begins with agricultural cooperatives. And in the late 1800s, the whole question of whether, frankly, rural America was going to survive with, with, with individual farmers and ranchers trying to make a living off the land and the idea that they had to bind together uh, in, in, in cooperatives for multiple purposes, but in particular in terms of the supply chain, uh, the cost of input, and the marketing of output. And that's a discussion that's taking place in earnest now in Cuba. And what we see in the history of the cooperative movement in the U.S. is that other types of cooperatives evolved out of that thinking. And I, and I see the same possibility here, that as the agricultural cooperatives get stronger and, and the interrelationship with the, the U.S. Uh, in terms of trade and, and inputs uh, uh, grows, we're going to see much more discussion of that. And I think that's, that's going to be very healthy overall. In relationship to the, the government comment earlier, um, if you look at the U.S. electric, co electric cooperatives, the credit unions, the ag co-ops, there has always been a public-private partnership um, from the start. And I think if we, if we stress the idea that public-private partnerships are a good thing, can be a good thing, uh, in my sector for electric, for example, standards are still used that started back in 1936 with the Rural Electrification Administration. Um, uh, accounting standards, engineering standards. The engineering standards that are used today 
make it possible for one electric cooperative to help out in a disaster recovery situation with another because those line crews can come in there um, and they, they get to work right away because we're working off the same standards. So if you think of standards generically and the potential of a government's role in setting standards, um, that's not government interference, that's government support uh, for productivity and uh, efficiency. Amy, some further comments? Yeah, just a couple of observations and talking with some of the workers. We also met with um, transportation cooperative that provided public transportation for schools and hospitals and things. Um, and also a produce market as well as some artisan, um, newly formed artisan cooperatives. Um, one of the things that some of the workers said was at first when, when they found out that they were going to be converting to a cooperative, there was a lot of skepticism and sort of a, a fear, I mean, as you can imagine. Um, but a year into their cooperative and their, and, and their own member ownership, um, there, I agree, there was a lot of optimism. Um, they said, they told us their previous salaries and their current salaries, some of them had doubled and tripled their salaries. Um, several of them had mentioned that um, they, they, you know, there, there, was, a, there was some question about, um, you know, what, what was going to happen with the assets and the leasing and things like that. There was a little, some uncertainty there, but also a lot, of, for the example, the sewing cooperative, they still did sell some of their product to the state, but half of their uh, product was going to private sector buyers. So this, this transformation from a state-run enterprise into a more market-based economy was really profound for some of them. I did want to mention a couple of the challenges that they mentioned, though, um, and that we saw as a group, which are also outlined in the report that's in your, um, that are in the packets. Um, the, the initial leadership of the cooperatives was sort of elected and voted in open membership, but primarily the former bosses of the state-run enterprises became the leaders. And um, in some ways, I think that that was good because there was experience and managerial and technical experience and sort of running the business, if you will. But some of those leaders had really taken on this responsibility of, the, of converting to a cooperative and, and, and really un could articulate clearly what the cooperative for structure was supposed to be, the formation, some of the principles that were built into the law and the regulations. So they were quite articulate about that and what they were supposed to look like. And they had really taken that leadership on. I think at some point though, um, there's going to have to be a more open democratic way of, of managing the, the leadership. And I think that was in um, transformation. <clears throat> One other thing I did want to point out is one of the biggest challenges that we saw was the lack of inputs, uh, especially in the agricultural side. The lack of access to buying inputs in an open market system was, was a major constraint for the growth of these businesses. So I think um, uh, the question about trade is, is important in that as markets start to open up, um, hopefully these cooperatives will have better access to, to their raw materials and things like seeds and fertilizer that um, that will help them to continue to grow their businesses. The final point that I wanted to make is that um, I think there was a real desire there to, um, as they continue to develop their businesses, to start connecting out with other cooperatives in Cuba, other leaders, and then also with the international community. And I think it's kind of baby steps as they start to consolidate these businesses um, right now, they're very much looking inward at how do we run this business and how do we continue to employ everyone and get everyone paid and do all of that. Um, I think at some point that's going to start to turn outward and we're going to start to see more linkages happening, more connections, and more desire to really be a part of a broader international movement. Eric, some final thoughts? Yeah. Um, I'd like to just add that on the issue of international principles, um, very clearly in the legislation that the Cubans have enacted, if you look down the list of how the cooperative should be run, they very closely adhere to international principles of cooperation. So that's a good sign. But I also agree with Amy that there needs to be a lot more educational work. And you know, again, we're starting a pro they're starting a process there, so it takes time. But I, I think there's some good steps in the beginning that indicate um, 
a connection with the international movement that can be very solid. I think on the question, and I realize that we don't have positions on you know, government related things necessarily, but I think one area which is really important is the issue of trade credits. Um, I could foresee, for example, that if it were possible for there to be credit authorized to agricultural cooperatives and others, but especially agricultural cooperatives, the amount of production could grow significantly in a really pretty short period of time, both for local domestic consumption in Cuba, but also for export to U.S. cooperatives that are, would be happy to receive those uh, commodities for sale here in the United States. So I think the issue of what is permissible with regard to U.S. financing is not clear yet, and that's something that needs to be thought through the legislation and the regulations. And lastly, kind of taking up the, the vision from 10,000 miles above, I think that this is really an interesting moment for Cuba. It's very experimental, it's bold, they are trying things. Are there frustrations? Sure. Do things go slower? Are there lots of obstacles? Yeah. But they're embarking upon creating a cooperatively based economy to a larger extent than we're seeing other places in the world. And that's really interesting, not only for the potential for Cuba to, as it evolves, but I think another part of what do we learn from each other is if you can really have a country at that scale using cooperatives effectively to be a dynamic part of the economy, which I think Mike mentioned, protects local interests, which other people have mentioned increases the benefits to the actual producers and consumers. Well, I think that's a wonderful thing for all of us, and I think that could be a real shot in the arm, not only for Cuba, but for the international cooperative movement. And gosh knows, we certainly need some new models to look at to generate more jobs and create a more welfare in our society. So thank you, Cuba. And I hope we can get more engaged with this. All right, we're going to thank this panel. And I'm going to ask the second panel to come on up, and we're going to dig further into the political and the legislative. So. Uh, Alan Knapp from, from our staff at NCBA Clusa. Uh, is going to give us a little bit of the framework of what's going on on the Hill and what's going on uh, uh, regulatory-wise. Uh, John Weinfurter is going to join us, uh, and John is uh, and his firm have been very involved in uh, in, in working closely with the uh, Cuban legation and uh, the work that's going on uh, between two countries. And uh, Patrick Lapine is here from the League of Southeastern. Uh, credit unions, um, the association for credit unions in Florida and Alabama, and can give us the perspective of what's going on inside of, of the financial working. So, Alan, if you can uh, kind of set the stage for us with what, what's, what is the, the, the legislative framework, what is the regulatory process going on right now? Well, thanks, Mike. And I'm going to start with, uh, first of all, the regulations that came out on January 16th, uh, which really implemented the President's announcement on December 17th. The, uh, and really, uh, looking at, and in your briefing books, you have kind of a side-by-side -side analysis of the, uh, of the Treasury and Commerce rules. But really, we want to talk about an, an opportunity, I, th I think, here, which is a kind of a stars aligning moment for both the work uh, that's going on in Cuba and also the, uh, the goals of the United States government in terms of uh, the, the Commerce rule really talks about how do we, it rec first of all, recognize the nascent Cuban private sector um, both in the uh, in follow-ups from the State Department and Commerce um, last month, it did talk about that, that cooperatives in Cuba are part of that nascent private sector. Uh, really what it is, it's, it's, it's a stars aligning moment where we, we have all of these changes that are going on in the non-agricultural non uh, cooperative space in Cuba and the goal of the United States government to really um, align the uh, the work that's going on um, with the cooperatives and, and how it helps them provide greater independence from the state. So reading the uh, commerce regulations here, for, for example, on the, um, it adds a new license exception to the export administration regulations. Uh, items include building materials to construct or renovate privately owned buildings, goods for use by private sector entrepreneurs, such as the uh, mechanic shop. 
uh, goods for use by private sector uh, entrepreneurs and tools for equipment uh, for, for private sector agricultural ac uh, activity it is intended to facilitate Cuban citizen access to lower price goods to improve living standards and greater independence from the state. So really where we are with, with that is, is how do we communicate that message to both um, uh, the Department of Treasury, the Department of Commerce, uh, possibly the Department of State, and folks on the Hill. And how do we continue to provide that, that we can be a resource as the collective co-op community um, around those and, and, and really help uh, drive those discussions going forward. I think it's a really good opportunity to both meet the needs of the Cuban workers as well as meet the needs of the U.S. government in terms of providing for the nascent private sector and providing uh, these, these worker-owned businesses a sense of ownership and greater economic independence from the state. That's comprehensive. Thank you, Alan. Um, John, you've been very involved in, uh, in working right at the side of, of all of the negotiation and, and effort that's going on uh, between the two governments. Can you, can you fill us in and talk a little bit about what you, what you perceive is happening and how that impacts what we're trying to do here with co-ops? Well, let me just say to begin, I think what Alan was saying is that if you look hard enough at the guidelines that came out of Treasury, there's something in it for everyone, for everyone. You just have to look hard enough. <laughs> but I've been working on this issue for a long time. I was the chief of staff on the Hill to Congressman John Joseph Moakley from Boston for 21 years. Um, we uh, were much involved in the 90s and the first decade of this century in working on that issue. Um, largely at the request of some of our constituents. We had Ocean Spray in our district, we had Reebok in our district, we had the Massachusetts League of Credit Unions in our district, all of whom 20 years ago had an interest in finding new business in Cuba, um, especially Ocean Spray. They were determined that there was a role for them to play in expanding the agricultural relationship between Cuba and the United States. As luck would have it, we had a job opening in our office and in 1981 or 1982, a young man from Worcester, Massachusetts came by, interviewed for the job as our communications director and legislative assistant. We hired him and his name was Jim McGovern, who you all know now is a leader on the Hill as a member of Congress himself in the Cuba-US uh, negotiations effort. Um, he has been spectacular on this issue, I think in the judgment of most R's and most D's. Um, he was a part of the Pelosi Codell to Cuba two weeks ago, along with David Cicilline from Rhode Island and seven other members. Another stalwart on the Republican side in the Senate is Jerry Moran, who has been really, really effective in terms of representing his Kansas constituents on ag issues, on aviation issues, in terms of expanding the, uh, the nascent relationship between the Cubans and the U.S. Um, my job, in terms of what I do with NCBA, is to encourage an ever-expanding dialogue between the Cubans and the cooperative community here in this country. In fact, until just a couple of days ago, we thought getting the ambassador to come this morning was a 50-50 shot. But the negotiations are underway, and uh, obviously that became impossible. I also have to say that the Cuban legation here in Washington is uniquely responsive. They return your calls. They are exceedingly appreciative for information that they get. They try to pass along information that they have to us. Um, we've established a very good relationship with the deputy charge of mission there, a guy named Jesus Perez de Calderon. We've met with him several times. Um, he is very much aware of Mike's visits and NCBA's visits to Cuba last July. He's much, much interested in seeing what he can do from his vantage point to increase the effectiveness and the efficacy that uh, cooperatives play within the Cuban economy. Obviously, that is a discussion that's open for much discussion here, in the international media, in the Congress, et cetera. But I have no doubt that that discussion is coming and coming fast. I think that the Cuba issue is playing out exactly the way that those of us here at NCBA would like it to play out in members' congressional districts across the country. Almost every member of Congress, even those that are most stalwart opponents, and I'll let Pat discuss that, <laughs> but I think even they see that the, the times are changing and that there are issues in their district that are impacted and impacted positively by an increased level of communication and increased level of economic activity between the Cubans and the United States. Um, I think I'll end there and turn it over yeah, I'm going to, you know, Patrick's coming at this from, from two places. Certainly the, the, the realities of the closeness of uh, Cuba to, uh, to Florida is, uh, we always hear about that, you know, very short trip, but when you actually get on the plane in Miami and 
you, you don't even get a beverage before you're landing, reminds you that you know it's a much shorter trip than you really do think. So the Florida relationship is, is an interesting, important one, but also the, the financial, that, that there has been a lot of, and, and one of the things I think we saw on our trip was um, this amazing sort of, of movement of uh, you know, dozens of airplanes per day full of Cuban Americans going back and forth with products, with services, with, with financial needs. And, and so the, the part of how credit unions fit into this is also interesting. So we're glad to have you, Patrick. Thanks, Mike, uh, and thanks to uh, the, the NCBA for its leadership on this issue. And, and, and Mike's right. I mean, we, uh, you know, as he said in, during some of his opening comments, we have about 6,300 credit unions nationally and over 100 million members now throughout the United States. And as you can imagine, uh, we have uh, quite a few credit unions in South Florida that uh, either have staff, members, directors, the volunteer directors of those credit unions that are Cuban-American. And, and when this issue really started to resonate, um, last year, there's, there's a significant amount of interest on how can credit unions be part of um, the opening up of Cuba and helping provide financial services to Cuba. You know, really credit unions throughout the world have always worked very closely among themselves. And, and here in the United States and the state associations like my state association, which represents credit unions both in Florida and Alabama, we have a close partnership with Costa Rica. And through that partnership, what we do is we have exchanges where our staff goes down there and assists them with um, items that they need assistance with. They come up to the United States, to our states and other places to get training and to get some of that technical assistance on, on things that are important for them to be able to grow their credit unions. We actually have a trip planned. We're gonna be going down in Costa Rica in May to actually help them with learning how to lobby better. Because in a lot of these emerging countries, like Cuba will be, when it comes to financial services, they need to put new laws on the books and regulations. And as you can imagine, they've never really had experiences really with advocacy and, and learning how to effectively try to communicate that to, state, to, to, to their national officials. So um, this, this conference that we're going to be going down to and helping facilitate some lobbying tips on uh, in, uh, in May is not only for Costa Rica, but it's actually for... For, for financial cooperatives and for credit unions around the Caribbean and Central America, so it's a unique opportunity. But if you really think about everything that has been talked about up to this point, um, especially a lot of it focusing on agriculture, but also using the example of the local um, um, uh, mechanics and, 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 and auto shop, one thing, that a common theme through all of that is there's gonna be a need for safe and for um, consistent financial services. And if you think about going from a, a communist society to you know, to the other extreme, a capitalist society like we have in the United States, I think the happy medium and where, and where, and where credit unions are so well positioned is, is through that cooperative model, is to be able to, you know, take the extension of what the Cuban government is already saying about, about giving ownership over to the workers and having, you know, financial cooperatives that are owned by their members be able to control the financial future. And there's gonna be a strong need for that. So we're very excited about the opportunity. We know we have a lot of credit unions um, who are Cuban Americans that are ready and willing to participate, who have family members, who have staff members that are traveling, as Mike said, back and forth all the time right now. I have a staff member in my government affairs department who is Cuban American. So, you know, it, it, then when you get to Florida, it becomes not the exception, but the norm, and there's a lot of interest there. So we're very excited to be able to, to try to partner to, through the training, uh, through, through helping credit unions get started and to help them with everything they needed. And I think this is a great opportunity. The other thing that I think is very important to mention as well is that this isn't unique to us. Um, it wasn't that long ago when the uh, Soviet Union collapsed and we saw financial cooperatives and, fi and, and uh, uh, start up in Eastern Europe. And one of the best examples of success is that is in Poland. You know, Poland has a thriving credit union system or financial cooperative system as they would like to call it. Um, and it really is, if you look at the Eastern, Eastern Bloc, former Eastern Bloc nations, it is probably the strongest one. And I would argue a lot of that's because of the financial cooperatives that was started there. So credit have experience working with former communist nations on that transition uh, to, to having a cooperative system. So we're very excited to continue to export that model uh, to Cuba and, and is our exciting times. Can I open it back up for questions? Hi, Mary Berger again with Washington Trade Daily. As you're looking at the regulations, is it clear to you or do you feel confident that uh, the Cuban cooperatives will be viewed by the U.S. government as private sector enterprises? 
Alan, you want to take on I'll that? I'll be one? happy to answer that. And, and the answer is yes. In two cases, both in the uh, State Department, uh, there's a State Department fact sheet from February 13th, um, and also the Commerce Department, the Bureau of Industry and Security, held a teleconference on February 18th. In both cases, they did refer to uh, the Cuban cooperatives, the, the ones that are the non-ag cooperatives primarily, uh, that, are, uh, that are coming about, that they are in fact the nascent private sector according to the regulations. Um, and, and that's been very, very important uh, to us because making sure of that is, is, is crucial. And I know, John, you've had other conversations as well inside uh, with the, the Cuban legation uh, uh, to that issue as well. One thing that I would add is that above and beyond the agricultural sector, um, the future is, I would say, less clear. Um, the OFAC license requirements are kind of on a catch-as-catch-can basis from my background. Uh, my firm is led by a guy named James Lee Witt, who was President Clinton's former FEMA director. We are involved in a bunch of drilling issues, or would like to be involved in a bunch of drilling issues in Cuban waters. Obviously, when it comes to that issue, the U.S. State Department would much prefer that Cuban drillers partner with an American company that has a safety track record than a Malaysian company or a Nigerian company or a Chinese com uh, company, given how many miles to the Florida beaches? Not that very short. <laughs> um, and, and it's interesting because the State Department is trapped. On the one side, they want to ensure the safety and the environmental um, guidelines uh, that uh, the citizens of South Florida require. But on the other side, they confront the embargo that is a daily presence in their lives. And they're caught in the middle of those two realities. So our job is to work the Treasury OFAC uh, license area. And it's very, very confusing. Every single law firm that you talk to has a different opinion. They can issue huge amounts of verbiage and guidelines, but they don't necessarily agree with each other. So my experience would say there's no definitive answer in many of the non-agricultural issues. Um, I don't know, if Pat, would you agree with me there? I would agree. I mean, it seems like, I mean, this has all happened very quickly. Right. And, uh, and I think for a, a lot of folks, um, they're still trying to understand, um, you know, the impacts and there's still many unan more unanswered questions than I think answers right now. So I know like, for example, even the, the Florida legislature, um, which just came into, uh, went back to session about a week ago, I mean, they're debating some legislation regarding this issue as well. Um, obviously, some members of our congressional delegation um, and our senators have taken strong positions on this as well. But with that being said, I think for us, from our position, is to not to try to get in the middle from a political standpoint. Um, let them figure that out. Um, and ultimately, I think that there will be some level of consensus over time. And I think as, as Cuba opens up, I think we'll see where um, there'll be a lot of successes that we can't argue with. Well, and you know, one of the points that we continue to, to look at is that Cuba's still on the terrorism list. And no matter, you know, <laughs> this is, it's all happening so quickly that there is a rush and, and I think everybody's wanting to take steps forward, but some of these uh, realities in the regulatory and legislative arena are going to continue to be part of the, well, the, the landscape. I, would add is I think that um, Roberta Jacobson and Josephina Vidal have made a lot of progress in that state sponsored terrorism issue. Yep. I think that there aren't many people at state or aren't many people at Treasury that classify Cuba as Sudan or Syria or Iraq or some of the other nations on that list. They can evidence absolutely no history of Cuban presence in some of those issues as it impacts the U.S. government in the last 20 years. Um, so I think that that's going to be one of the issues that they might safely negotiate, but also very quietly negotiate because of political reality in this country. They don't want to heighten the, the debate in the Congress on that issue with some stalwarts in the, uh, the debate that have been there for 25 years. Pat, would you? Next question. Uh, Victoria Guido from Politico again. Uh, on the state sponsor of terrorism question, um, is that something that really has much of a practical effect given that the embargo still exists, or is that just sort of, you know, uh, a, a first step in sort of showing goodwill? I mean, uh, as far as I understand, there's a lot of overlap in terms of what being on that list does and having the embargo in place. Well, I'm going to start, and then I'm going to ask Alan to jump in with some more of the specifics. You know, I think that our sense of it is that, uh, you know, the embargo is, is legislative. The embargo has been part of the landscape for a long time. 
the, the terrorism uh, list is, you know, an overlay to this. Um, I think there's something very, uh, you know, John's, I think that's the point you were making, is there's something very, uh, you know, political out of this, and taking that away does take us a step forward, but it does make, the, you know, the point that, that for more things to happen and more things to go forward, that the legislation around the embargo is going to have to be looked at by Congress and by the administration. Yeah, and currently there are a dozen bills currently in Congress right now that uh, do a number of things regarding uh, mainly travel and trade and, and some other things. Um, uh, th the current law that they operate under, the, the president has authority to, uh, to, to tweak the embargo regulations but cannot lift the embargo unless there are uh, steps, for, uh, steps towards uh, Cuban opening up uh, to become a democratic, uh, democratic elections and things like that. Human rights is still a major issue. Um, for a lot of the, the, the current congressional bills. I, I think where the scope of this, uh, of this uh, U.S.-Cuba Cooperative Working Group really uh, can, can lend its hand, and, and we'll, we'll leave those questions to others, but the scope of this really is, while we have the recognition from Treasury and Commerce that these nascent uh, Cuban uh, private sector and cooperatives are part of that, uh, that we need to continue to, to with, with this working group, and, and this is just a foundation going forward, is really to make sure that um, we continue to work with folks on the Hill and folks in the administration about um, really three things. It's recognition of cooperatives, continued recognition that they are legitimate businesses and, and can really play a role in, in um, opening up Cuba, uh, that they are eligible for the provisions required or eligible under the regulations, and that there's simple parity um, with, with other businesses. And I think with the going forward with the U.S. Cooperative, Cuba Cooperative Working Group, we can really help play a role in answering a lot of those questions to folks on the Hill and the administration um, and have them, uh, it, it, it's, it's a joint effort. It, it helps the Cuban workers and it also um, meets the U.S. government's demands that, that we uh, continue to help uh, uh, kind of grow this economic independence from the state. Yeah, you know, and also, Alan, I mean, I think, uh, I, something like 60% of Congress is, is new since 2009. And this embargo has been in place for over 50 years. So I think there's a lot of education to do and to take a, a fresh look at uh, the relationship today and how the world has changed um, over the last uh, 20 years and really be able to think about how we can help the Cuban people going for, forward. And I definitely think the cooperative model is, 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 is the best model through this, through this period. Additionally, you know, through some of the experiences I had with Costa Rica and some other um, developing cranes internationally, um, clearly we need to have some regulation, especially in the financial services sector, moving into this type of partnership and relationship. But at the same time, what I have seen is some tremendous growth um, and empowerment when it comes to individuals and to consumers in other countries. And a lot of that's because they don't have the level of regulation that we have here. So we need a right, certain amount of regulation, and that's expected, especially in financial services and some other, some others. But it's also we need to get out of the way and let and let to have that 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 natural organic growth. And I think that we will see as people start to get empowered in all sectors in Cuba. The, the one last thing that I would add too is that there's a logistical issue here that we have to address as well. The OFAC Office of Treasury has received as many inquiries. I don't know if it's actual OFAC license requests, but inquiries between December 16th and today that they've received in the past 10 years combined. So they are dealing with the same workforce that they've had for 10 years, processing a hugely expanded workload on the part of Treasury staff. Also, at the, the Cuban legation here in town, you essentially have 12 sector staff that handle ag, manufacturing, security, education, pick an issue, 12 staff to handle all of these issues that impact the U.S. economy. And I'm also told by the, by the um, uh, Cuban uh, DCM that the average salary at the Cuban legation for somebody doing this kind of work is between $29,000 and $34,000 a year. So on that salary at the Cuban legation, you have to live in the Washington suburbs and feed your family. So there are real economic and logistic pressures on both the U.S. and the Cubans in terms of how quickly this process moves forward internally. I think we've reached just about the end of our time. We've got maybe one question to take in the back. Uh. My, name is, my name is Bill Earl. I'm with the National Association of Beverage Importers. Um, one of the industries that got nationalized in Cuba was the rum industry uh, right after the, you know, the revolution. 
have you come upon any strategies for determining what is still nationalized, not nationalized, or have been turned over to friends of the administration in Cuba that uh, would pass muster to have an entrepreneurial dialogue with? Uh, that seems to be a murky, tricky zone to operate in. But obviously, as beverage importers, we're very interested in this. So, yeah, th uh, that's not been part of uh, the framework to our working group, but I, I, the point you raise, and, and we're going to have to continue to do this, is is to really look closely at at uh, how the uh, a number of b businesses were were, uh, were were impacted in the, the times and coming forward. And you know, our work with cooperatives has been somewhat different than that. But I do think that as this all opens up. You know, the linkages to financial, the linkages into agriculture are all going to bring this all back to a place where we're going to have to uh, understand what the determinations of the Cuban government are um, and how the U.S. government uh, operates uh, the relationship going forward based on uh, the embargo, based on the framework that we have. So I appreciate the question, but I think it's, it's been a bit outside of what we've done with cooperatives. Um, I want to thank all of you for, uh, for, for being here. And we've got one time for, John tells me now one, he keeps telling me one more question and then he continues. So I'll, I'll uh, make sure we get an answer here. Um, Ellen Ferguson, CQ Roll Call. I just wanted to make sure I came away with this as a firm impression of what you're doing because I focus on Congress. Sure. Um, so it sounds as though what you're saying is you're focusing more on the uh, um, direct dealings with the cooperatives in Cuba and standing on the sidelines as far as things happening in Congress? Well, what I can tell you is this. Um, we are going to, uh, we're releasing today the, uh, the, the white paper that, that our first trip produced. Um, we are announcing today our intention to go back twice um, in, into Cuba in the summer and into the fall. Um, we are very interested in creating linkages. I think Amy pointed out that one of the things that we want to see is, I think, a greater linkage um, with our counterparts there. Uh, there aren't the same level of, of associational partners, but I think that's something that probably will be happening over time, especially with this, uh, uh, these non-agricultural cooperatives as they grow. Um, I think what you see us doing is watching very closely, uh, especially how co-ops are treated uh, in U.S. law. Um, and we feel very comfortable that the conversation to this point has been very clear that cooperatives are businesses and that as the conversation moves forward, it's in the regulatory environment, that cooperatives are, are seen as going to be uh, treated like everybody else. And that's been our, our main focus and our main effort. As legislation moves forward around things like the embargo or um, you know, other the political issues, I think we have chosen to stay uh, at the economic and the cooperative level at this point. Uh, we'll be listening to our members and talking to them about this. Uh, our own board of directors will be talking about it. But I think as we, you, you look at this panel, and I think all of us know that we've got a responsibility to, uh, first, to the consumer, to, to the, the individual member owner uh, in Cuba, the individual member owner in the US, and making sure that there's economic fairness um, and so our role in building this, um, you know, this group, this cooperative working group, Cuba U.S. Cooperative Working Group, um, is I think to look at the next steps. Um, you know, it's not never to say never, but I believe that we feel like the the conversation, the framework that's going on right now, is very positive for cooperatives, um, and that because the Cuban economy is is being now made up so much by cooperatives, there is learning to do by us, that this understanding of how cooperatives can you know, really impact the economy, um, it is something that happens every day in the US. But you know, to see it at this level and, the, and in this opportunity at the, at the Cuban starting point is really exciting. Um, so are there opportunities for agriculture? Definitely. We think that's probably the starting point. Looking at these worker co-ops, um, and one of the points that didn't get made earlier is that worker co-ops in the U.S. are evolving from uh, owner, owner businesses here in the U.S. So as baby boomers are retiring, 
the, the workers are actually buying out the owner and running those as worker co-ops. There's lots of examples of that happening. So we have our own evolution happening here in the U.S. towards worker co-ops. And I think then when you add in you know, the potential of how does the electrification happen in Cuba, how does the financial structure get built, Martin made a great point of saying you need the framework because you need to be able to link into it. So uh, I would also quickly add, too, that as we receive word of Codell's departing for Cuba, Mike and I and John McKechnie in the back of the room look at the, comp the uh, uh, who's comprising the Codells and try to figure out who individually we could meet with, what information we could share, and could we ask that individual Codell member to take a message to Cuba on our behalf? And that's certainly the conversation that Jim McGovern has had on our behalf there. Uh, Mike and I are having dinner next week with David Sisseling from Rhode Island, who just returned from the Pelosi. Uh, Codell will make the same request of him. It's been, I think, a productive road to travel, and we only see that expanding as we go forward. Yeah, I mean, we will be involved in, in um, quite, quite a bit with the, with the Codells, just to, for an educational aspect, just making sure that members are aware of what is going on in Cuba. Uh, with, with cooperative development. Uh, we, we will be working directly with, with trying to work with co-ops, setting governance and making sure uh, uh, providing the expertise for them to succeed is, is really what, what's, what's at the scope of the U.S.-Cuba Cooperative Working Group. But there's an opportunity here again to, um, we have letters to Secretary Liu and Secretary Pritzker, um, again clarifying the fact that uh, there should be recognition of co-ops, eligibility and parity. And we'll continue to, uh, to pursue those. On behalf of all of us here at the National Cooperative Business Association, we thank you for joining us for our launch of the U.S. Cooperative, U.S. Uh, Cuba Cooperative Working Group. Thank you very much.